this being the week of Good Friday, I thought it would be uh, good to look at the seven last words of our Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. The first three were given during the first three hours from 9 to 12. <clears throat> the last three from 12 to 3. And so we begin, and if you'd like to follow along with me, that would be great. I'll be translating out of my Greek New Testament, but it will all be in English. So in Luke 23, verse 34, if we could turn there, it reads, And Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Notice the first statement on the cross is one of forgiveness. And one of the things that we learn from Jesus is that we need to forgive those that are hurtful and say hurtful things and do things that are hurtful. I'm reminded of Jesus in his high in his great in the great uh, sermon on the mount where he says that we're to forgive those and if we pray for forgiveness, the prayer is, Father, forgive us as we have forgiven others. And so one of the most important things we learn from this first statement is the need of forgiveness. And that will give us spiritual health, too, to harbor any kind of unforgiving spirit is not healthy. And so in the first statement, Jesus then teaches us by his example about the need of forgiving those that would be unkind uh, to us. Secondly, we look at Luke 23, verse uh, 43, where we have the second statement. Remember the two uh, criminals upon the cross, the one did not believe, but the other one really said to Jesus out of a heart of true belief, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And then Jesus said, verily, verily, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Notice the words of Jesus here to the thief on the cross. He said, this very day we'll be together. You'll be with me in paradise. Now, paradise is a word that refers to garden. And in the context here, I believe it is looking clearly at the Lord's presence, at the presence of God. We see this, for example, in Luke 16, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, who is caught up to paradise, to Abraham's bosom. Again, uh, a symbol of a banquet scene in the presence of the Lord. So can we say paradise is looking at God's presence, uh, being in his presence? It's the word that means garden. And it reminds us of Adam when he walked with the Lord. And then after the fall, he lost his presence. And uh, so what a beautiful statement here. This very day you're going to be with me. It is interesting that when you read this, even though, even though they're dying physically, Jesus is dying physically, the thief on the cross is dying physically, that's not the end of it because he says this very day you're going to be with me and we're going to be in paradise. And, you know, I believe clearly here in my own conviction that he's not talking about a soul sleep, but actually we're going to be together. You have something that you can look forward to, and that is today you will be with me in paradise. One of the things that we've often thought in the Hebrew scriptures, there doesn't seem to be a reference to the intermediate state that at least is very clear. Uh, by that I mean when the soul leaves the body. But here, I believe Jesus is really saying, if you have faith in him, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
And that is exactly what Paul uh, reiterates in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And so it gives real hope to a believer in Christ Jesus that the soul is in a conscious state of awareness in the presence of Christ being with him, even though the body uh, is dying and through crucifixion, the thief on the cross, his body would die. But today, you're going to be with me. What a beautiful, reassuring statement that the Lord gives us here. My thinking is that even in the Hebrew uh, times, that the Old Testament saints also went to be with the Lord in his presence. But it was not revealed until we come to hear, and we hear it very clearly revealed, that to be absent from the body for a believer is to be present with the Lord. So following this statement, we then come to John chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. John 19, 26 and 27. And this is where Jesus will address his mother and the disciples, the disciple whom Jesus loves. So in 19, chapter 19, verses 26 and 27, it says that Jesus, when he saw his mother and the disciple standing whom he loved, he says to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he says to the disciple, uh, son, behold your mother, or behold your mother. You know, I see something very striking here, and it says, and from that time, from that hour on, that disciple took uh, the mother, took her into his, literally the Greek reads, ta idia, his own things. I believe it means he took her to be with him. And one of the things that I think we need today is community. One of the lacking things of our time is this idea that people are islands and they can live by themselves and no need of family or community. And what a beautiful statement that Jesus is making here about the need of being together in a spiritual family. And I've thought about the church, how the church needs to be a spiritual family. They need to, to live in fellowship with one another. And so often it's like people go to church and they're there for an hour and then everybody goes back to their island again. And I really think that there needs to be more reflection on how to create a real family, especially in a time when families are scattered, uh, they don't live in the same geographical area, and it's not like it used to be. And so I think what a lesson that Jesus is teaching about the need of spiritual family and may the church. And I pray that ministers will make every effort to create a real spiritual family for every believer in their church. So following this statement, this is the third statement. We then have the fourth in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. It is from the uh, noon to three, darkness came upon all the land until the ninth hour, which would have been around three o'clock. And we're told that Jesus cried out at that time in a great voice. And th these would now be the last four statements upon the cross. Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In this fourth word, I believe Jesus is quoting from Aramaic, uh, which became really the lingua franca of the day. The Hebrew of Psalm 22 is Eli, Eli, lemma azabtani, 
where here we have Savaktani. And Savak would be the Aramaic translation of Azab, to forsake. And it's used of like an utter forsaking. For example, if, if a man abandons his family or something like that, uh, this is the meaning of the word. And, and so I believe, as I look at this, that we're looking at Jesus Christ being separated from his heavenly father while he's upon the cross. And during those last three hours, darkness comes on the scene. And I believe it's depicting this eternal separation that was going on between the father and the son when Jesus is bearing the sins of all humankind upon himself, upon the cross. And I believe in those hours upon the cross, he is suffering an eternal, can I say, judgment for everyone who's willing to put their faith in him as Lord and Savior. And so I think what we're seeing here is an abandonment. It's like Jesus actually experiences an eternal death. And I can't grasp that, but something that I believe the text is clearly implying, an eternal spiritual death for us and as we, for all mankind. And as we believe in him as our Lord and Savior, we are rescued from that judgment through our faith in Jesus Christ. So this uh, fourth word is very meaningful as I think it looks at that again that completed, uh, can I say, separation that Jesus is experiencing. And I think the eclipse is, or the eclipse is depicting that. A little bit later in Matthew, it is interesting, the veil in verse 51 of the temple is rent in two from top to bottom. The veil was about four inches thick. And if you think about it being actually now rent in two, what it's really saying is the way now into the Holy of Holies is now open. And Jesus Christ, by his divine sacrifice and by that eternal, uh, can I say, uh, bearing our sin penalty of all mankind, the way is now open into God's presence, into the Holy of Holies. There's no longer a veil there. Christ has become the high priest. His body has become the veil now, as the writer of Hebrews will tell us. And so we now can go directly through Christ into God's glorious presence. What a beautiful, beautiful uh, teaching Matthew's presenting here to his Jewish uh, readers who have accepted Jesus as the Messiah. So then as we move on, we come to the next word upon the cross. And that is found in John chapter 19, verses 28 and 30. John chapter 19, verses 28 and 30. And we're told that Jesus cries out and says, I thirst. We ask the question, why does John have that statement from the cross? The other gospels do not. I believe John is showing that Jesus was fully human, fully human and yet without sin. He who knew no sin becomes a sin offering for us. And yet he is fully human. <laughs> and so what I think we're seeing in John is the full humanity of Jesus. He said, I thirst. When we look at the resurrection, <laughs> it's very physical. <laughs> Everything happens with Thomas uh, being told to put your finger uh, in my hand and in my side. So we're looking again at the physicality in John's gospel. And I think that's important to notice that Jesus was fully human. And yet <laughs> he knew no sin was without sin. So he cries out. I thirst. This is then followed in John 19, verse 30, with the amazing statement, 
to tell us thy. Notice we're told that Jesus, after taking, uh, after drinking, taking a little bit of the vinegar, says, to tell us thy, I, it is finished. <coughs> to tell us thy comes from the Greek word teleo, which means to finish. And what he's saying here, I believe, it has been completed. Everything is done. And what a beautiful, beautiful uh, word here. Everything is paid in full. <coughs> Everything is now finished. It has been completed. It's a perfect passive a tense here in Greek, which means it's completed action with results continuing into the present. What a beautiful, beautiful word and how that has meaning. We don't have to do other things to earn our salvation. It is already finished with what Jesus has accomplished. And then finally, we're told the last word is found in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. In the final word of Jesus upon the cross, notice what he says in chapter 23 of the Gospel of Luke, verse 46. Notice he says, Father, Pater. We move now from my God to my God to Father. Uh, atonement has been finished. Jesus has suffered on the cross uh, and really experienced an eternal death, so to speak, uh, for sure, for the sins of the world. And now we're back to Father again. We started out with Father, forgive them. Then we went, when the eclipse came, uh, to my God, my God. Now, after having suffered in the atoning work, it's now pater again. It's now Father. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And then we're told uh, when he said that, he expired. You know, years ago, I had a friend who was an evangelist and he told me one time he was in seminary and he almost lost his faith. Uh, there was that denial that Jesus was not God. And he said, one day as I was reading the Gospels, I came across this statement that into your hands I commit my spirit. And I realized he had to be God because only God could do that, could, could release his spirit voluntarily. No one else could ever have done that, only God. And so I believe here we see another indication of the divinity of Jesus, as well as his humanity that we saw in the statement, I thirst upon the cross. He is fully God. He is perfect, fully man without sin, but as the God man now, because he is God, is able to say into your hands, I commit my spirit. And so as we look at these words, there is a lot that we can think about theologically. We are to be forgiving, as we saw in the first word. We are, secondly, to basically uh, know that to be absent from the body is present with the Lord when we have our faith in Jesus Christ, according to his word here, today you shall be with me in paradise. Third, we need to create community, a spiritual community or a spiritual family, one of the greatest needs. And Jesus was saying this in the third word to his mother and to John. And then the fourth word, we realize that Jesus suffered an eternal death for all mankind, for all humankind, that if one is willing to accept that sacrifice, one has everlasting life. And then <clears throat> he said, I thirst. Jesus knows all of our weaknesses because he was fully human. 
and yet in his humanity, as we've said, without sin, but fully human. And then, uh, sixth, it is finished. <clears throat> we can know that everything is done. We don't have to do anything to work, to be saved. It's a completed reality. And the results are continuing into the present. And then finally, we know that Jesus had to be God for only one who is divine could say that last word, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Praise the Lord for Jesus Christ. <clears throat> May we worship him and adore him by believing in him as our Lord and Savior and growing in him every day.